like to talk about color vision. For those of you following along in the home version of this uh, class, and I hope some of you are, Caleb has been, I can tell, he has a book. Uh, Caleb, can you look at the table of contents in your book? Yeah. Okay. Let's give him a moment. And if you find that chapter that says color vision, what's the number next to it? Not the page number, but the chapter number. Eight. It's chapter eight. Okay, so for those of you using the third edition of the book, which is the one with the nice sea urchins on it, right? You may think they're balls of yarn. Yeah, uh, that's that's trick more than one person. Don't worry about it. Uh, that would, this would be chapter eight. There's a very good reason why uh, color vision was moved in front of spatial vision, and the reason for that is spatial vision is very tricky. And so when we talk about that next, you're going to get lost. And I'd like for you to not be lost all the time. The author of the book thought the same thing. <clears throat> all right. So what do we want to talk about? What do we want to talk about today is color. How many of you can see color? Is there anybody who is colorblind? Okay, well, we'll find out. Some of you may be, and you don't know it. I, I doubt it because there are only like four or three of you who I think might be colorblind, um, and I'm going to assume you're not. Right, this seems reasonable. All right, so there's this really interesting story of this guy who lost his ability to see color vision. He actually had what's called a closed head injury. Have any of you ever had a closed head injury? That's like a concussion where your head doesn't bust open, right? Okay. Uh, an open head injury is exactly what it sounds like. Your head sort of opens up, right? And so it's going to fracture the skull. A closed head injury is just you know some sort of impact, right? So you have those. Uh, what was really interesting is. Everything that he saw turned into this like gray colored uh, appearance, right? And so when he would look at other people, they looked like they were colored like rats, like rat colored, which is, I don't know, doesn't sound very appealing, right? Uh, what was really interesting about this is he started eating things that were only black or white. So he would eat like black olives or white rice because those looked correct. If he were to eat a banana, for example, that would not look right to him because he couldn't see the color yellow. He'd just see things that were black or white. So he really kind of, can you imagine if that was your diet? Like all you could eat were black olives, white rice, black coffee, and yogurt. Doesn't sound very appealing, right? Can you imagine, I'm thinking about this guy like just slicing up his olives, putting them in his yogurt. Abby, does that not sound appealing? No, no, why not? Okay, you don't have to answer that. Yeah. It's pretty gross, right? Uh, so color vision is very important to us, right? And so it's actually something that's, that's highly important. If you start to think about why do we have color vision, uh, color vision gives us a few important things. One, it lets us know if food is rotten, right? and that's kind of the prevailing theory, Marissa, is that it, that it lets us know if food is rotten. Uh, so a banana is a great example, right? Bananas come in three colors, green, yellow, and brown. Right? Seems pretty reasonable. Uh, and so which one of those do you typically eat? The yellow one. Yeah, the yellow one, right? Most people don't eat the green ones, and most people don't eat the brown ones, right? Because they're either not ripe enough yet, they're underripe, or they're overripe. Okay? And so then you try to just go for the, the ripe bananas in the middle. So that seems like a reasonable thing to do. There's also some idea, and we don't really have to talk about it in this class, because we can talk about it elsewhere, about um, like uh, color vision is a sign of sexual receptivity, right? So there are a lot of primate species who will turn their sort of uh, genitals bright red by increasing blood flow uh, as a sign of sexual receptivity, and that's obviously an important thing that you need color vision for. So go around looking for bright red nether regions. Um, color vision comes in handy. It's a true story. You're typing that now, aren't you? Notes to your mother, like here's what we talked about in class today. 
Uh, I'm also required to mention this was Oliver Sacks. I don't know if you know Oliver Sacks, right? He uh, is a brilliant individual, unfortunately he's dead, that uh, studied a lot of brain injuries. He's a neurologist, or a yeah, neuropsychologist. Okay, let's talk a little bit about light. We've already talked about this some, right? So we spent a long time talking about the physics here at Vision, right, Macy? So we really, you know this, right? But just as a reminder, here is that visible spectrum of light between 400 and 700 nanometers. That's what we're going to be focusing on today. We want to think about how these wavelengths of light are perceived. Short wavelengths, we usually perceive those as blue, right? So that's things near the 400 nanometer end of the spectrum, we're going to think about those as being blue uh, colored objects, or blue, blue light. The longer wavelengths are going to be red. Now these colors are not actually a property of the light itself, right? The property of the light itself that we're, we're interested in here is wavelength, right? So wavelength is what's important, not or wavelength is the property of the stimulus, not the color. The color is how we perceive it, right? The color is, is how our brains make sense of those different wavelengths of light, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So if we talk about how you perceive a color, it's perfect, or perceive light, it's perfectly fine to talk about the color. If we talk about how you are sensing the light, then we really need to talk about wavelength, okay? So we can talk about the other side, the stimulus side, not the perceptual side. So, if we want to think, we're thinking about perceptual color space, right? What's kind of interesting is there are really only a handful of, of sort of what we would call primary colors, right? If we were to ask you to describe the color orange by breaking it down into other colors, you could probably do that, right? You might talk about red and yellow, right, combining together to make orange. I'll remember if I ask you, to describe the color red by using other colors, like like breaking it down into more fundamental. That's really hard to do, right? Like like how does red break down into something else? Well, it doesn't really, does it? Okay. And so what's kind of interesting here is we have on this sort of perceptual color space, we have red, uh, yellow, blue, and green. Okay. And those four colors, if you think about those four colors, those are colors that we cannot, again, conceptually sort of break down. Now, three of these make a lot of sense. The green, the blue, and the red. And that's because we have cones that are specifically tuned to wavelengths of light that we perceive as red, blue, and green. Okay. The guy over here, yellow, that's a little tricky. We'll talk about that in a minute. When we think about color, there are really sort of three attributes that we want to think about. One of those is going to be hue. When we think about hue, we're thinking about what is the primary wavelength in that color, okay? What is the primary wavelength? Um, I think a great example here is red. When we think about red, the primary wavelength is going to be something, you know, in that 700 nanometer range, right, toward that end of the visible light spectrum. If we were to think about the color pink, for example, we would also say that pink is, is really a red, right? And that dominant or that primary wavelength of light is going to be in the wavelength of lights that we perceive as red, okay? But what might be different with pink is what is the, what we call saturation. So if you think about pink, it's really red with a bunch of other wavelengths mixed in, right? So it's what we would say is desaturated red, okay? So there are other wavelengths of light mixed in there that are going to dilute that a little bit. Okay. The third uh, attribute that we have for color is lightness. And when we think about lightness, we want to think about how bright something
again, most of the colors can be described, you know, somewhere between these colors, right? So if you were to think about, uh, how many of you like the color purple? Uh, specifically the, the, not the movie, just or the book, but just in case you, we're confused there. Those are also perfectly fine answers, but in this class we're going to focus more on the um, non-Danny Glover or Oprah Winfrey version. Uh, we're going to talk about the color itself. So purple would kind of go in this category between red and blue, right? If that makes some sense. Might have orange over here. Uh, you know, you can put your colors in, in a variety of places, right? Not a big deal. We did talk about those unique colors. Again, we can't really break those down into mixtures of other colors. Okay. There are really two sort of approaches to what we call color mixing. There's the subtractive uh, approach. And I'll tell you, this doesn't really work for what your brain does or what your retina does, right? How many of you have ever mixed paint together? Like finger paints, right? I know you guys are still into finger paints. Uh, anybody still do finger paints? I'm not to answer that. I, I can tell. I can tell which ones of you are still into that, Taylor. Not you, but some of the people around you. When we're doing subtractive color mixing, what we really do is each of the pigments or dyes is going to absorb a wavelength, uh, some wavelength, and reflect another. Whatever color we perceive is going to be whatever has not been absorbed, right? It's great, it's really practical, but it does not really give us any sort of um, idea about how color vision works, okay? And there's just an illustration of subtractive color mixing, nothing to worry about. Again, with subtractive color mixing, when these guys overlap, whatever's left is, you know, what's going to be reflected. On the other hand, what we really, um, what we really do in your retina is additive color mixture, okay? This is a different process. So, for example, these wavelengths from each of these sources, these three different color sources, light sources, will reach your photoreceptors and will add or sum those responses, right? We're not going to be subtracting things, we're going to be adding this response together. And we'll talk in a few moments, there's a really important concept about cone excitation ratios. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. This is, this is what we're going we're gonna to be, it's kind of the basis of that, okay? How many of you have a computer or a TV? Yeah, I'm going to assume all of you do, right? Uh, especially if you count your cell phone as a computer, which you probably should, right? It's kind of what they are. Uh, the displays that you see on TVs and computers work in the same way, right? They're very additive, and so they're these like color guns that light up. There's also this concept we're going to talk about, metamerism. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about metamers, which are going to be exciting. I'm going to describe what this is, and I'm going to show you a, a diagram that will hopefully help make this more clear to you. So, Abigail, a metamer is simply uh, a pair of light containing different wavelengths that appear to be identical. Okay? So I show you two patches of light, and to you they appear to be the exact same color. Okay? What's interesting about this is they're not actually the exact same wavelengths. They're actually different wavelengths of light. So that's kind of weird, right? Because I just sold you this story about wavelengths of light and different wavelengths being perceived as different colors. And now I'm telling you, Marissa, well, but not really, right? 
But really, this goes back to this guy, this idea of additive color mixture, right? And so if I can add two different wavelengths of light together in a certain way, then maybe I can make the same color that I would get if there was only one wavelength of light. That's really what a metamer is. So here's the basic idea. You've got that test patch. So we've got a patch of light. Right? And then there's another one that just has some mixture of other wavelengths, of different intensities. And what you can do is you can adjust those other wavelengths of light, the intensity of them, until that patch of light matches the other one. Okay? For everyone in here who either told me the truth or lied to me about your color vision capabilities, I don't know which it was, but we'll figure it out, Caleb. So if you're trying to harbor some protonopia over there and not let us know about it, we'll figure it out. So don't worry. If you're a normal observer, right, you will require no more than three primaries to make any test color. So any random wavelength of light that I show you, it will take you no more than three other wavelengths of light to kind of mix together to make that color. And that makes sense because how many uh, how many cone types do you have? It's three. Okay, you have three cone types, so that makes sense, right? So there are three that you can excite, right? So not so bad. What's really interesting about this is these matches are what we call lawful, so this is actually kind of cool. So let's imagine I have a patch of single wavelength of light that you perceive as purple, and then I have a patch of light with two other wavelengths of light, and they're mixed perfectly so that they are perceived as the same purple as that original patch, right? If I were to add another wavelength of light on top of that, so Regan, if I were to take that purple patch and add something to it that made it more red, if I had that same wavelength of light at that same intensity to my other patch with the two wavelengths, and now it has three, it will appear to be the exact same color again as that test patch. So they're lawful, right? So they follow the same. Once you've perceived it as the same color, whatever you do to that to change its color, if you do the same thing to the single wavelength of light, it's going to shift in the same direction. Okay? Does that make sense? So here you go. Here's the test light. We're going to look at it right here. It's going to be yellow. Here we have red, green, and blue light. You can adjust those intensities so that the patch here is the same color. Not a big deal. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? And that's what you need to know about metamers. Here's a chromatist. How many of you are really into, uh, you know, colors and dyes, and pigments? Anybody really excited about that? How many of you have a printer at home? Yeah. And you buy color ink for it? Yeah. Uh, so this is sort of the range of all sort of possible visible colors that we can see. That's kind of cool. There's a box, or like a triangle here. I'm going to kind of outline the edges of it. Okay. Uh, what's inside that triangle are really, that's pretty much what you see on most, um, and especially on older televisions. You know, newer televisions actually have a broader range of colors that you can see, uh, which actually brings up some interesting points about display technology. But what's inside of this really pretty well represents most of what you can actually see and that it can actually be reproduced cheaply, right? So, anybody bought a new TV lately? No, somebody did. Uh, there's some, some cool things going on with TVs these days. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the color white, right? So, Previously, it had been kind of difficult to get the color white to actually appear on your screen. 
And so quite often, if you have a, a slightly older television, if you look at the color of white, it's really blue. Uh, it's just the colors are rounded. We're going to talk about something called color contrast later. So that's going to be kind of cool. Although uh, some of the newer, like the 4K TVs and things, they actually have a true white. Right? I don't know if you've ever seen anything advertised that says it actually has a true white. Anybody? Nobody cares. That's fine. Uh, it's actually kind of important and interesting. Also, some of your displays, like your phones, uh, how many of you have uh, like a Samsung device? Yeah, awesome. The rest of you are probably going to fail this class. You should trade in your iPhone for Samsung. How many of you are iPhone people? So those are the people, Marissa, you can go ask them for money because they're easily duped. So, you're welcome to dupe that. Uh, so the, the cool thing about your phone, if it's a slightly more recent Samsung device, uh, the, the black or dark pixels on your device are actually turned off. Right? So anytime you see the color black on your screen, it's actually um, there's actually nothing there. So those pixels are, are actually turned off. Whereas some other displays will try to mix colors to make uh, to make the color black, make it dark. So that's pretty cool, right? Anybody excited by that? Am I going to go buy a Samsung device because of that? No, that's fine. Right. I, I don't get any kickbacks from them, so it doesn't really bother me. Any. All right, what do we need to think about here? Uh, we've already talked about spectral colors, not a big deal, mixtures are in the middle. You can really use this coordinate system to identify sort of any color that you want in that space. So I told you all of that sort of long and slightly boring story because this slide may be the, one of the most important slides in this chapter. Okay. And what's important about this slide is we're looking at um, cone excitation ratios here. Remember that time I told you cone excitation ratios were going to be important? We're going to talk about that. Justin, this is when we're, we're going to start that conversation. Okay. So, Here's what we need to do. You have three cone types. How many of you remember that you have three cone types? And that's why we call it trichromatic vision, right? Because it's three colors, okay, trichromatic. You have a short, a medium, and a long. Now look at this. What don't you see there? You don't see blue, green, or red, right, Zoe? Because we're talking about wavelengths of light. We're not talking about how you perceive that. We'll talk about that later. Now when you perceive the color red, or it is a red, what you perceive as a red light, a red color, what you end up with here is obviously your long wavelength sensitive cones are going to be really excited, right? That makes sense because they are specifically tuned for those longer wavelengths of light that you perceive as red. Okay, Does that make sense, Abby? And what, why would you anticipate something else? You wouldn't, would you? No. Now, because most of the time these light sources are not uh, like pure, right? So how many of you have ever seen the sun? Nobody? That's really sad. Uh, so Daniela, there is a sun, right? You know this exists. It's in the sky, right? We see it every day. Uh, it comes up, makes people nice and warm, melts ice, whatever, right? Does its thing, and then it disappears for a few hours, and then uh, thankfully it comes back, right? So we're all excited about that. So for example, the sun mostly throws off blue wavelengths of light, but it throws off a lot of other wavelengths of light as well, right? Any other light source is going to be similar to that. One that throws off primarily red or longer wavelengths will also throw out other wavelengths of light. Okay, So they'll throw out uh, the green and the blue wavelengths of light as well. So those cones will get a little bit excited as well, right? But not as much as those long wavelength sensitive cones. And so if we want to look at this, we want to look at cone excitation ratios, right? How much more excited is the red or the long sensitive, long wavelength sensitive cones than the other cones, right? So 
So that makes some sense, right? So how many of you can see the door? How many of you wish you were walking out of it? Yeah, a lot of you, right? But you came to class anyway for whatever reason. Uh, so, Regan, if you look at that door, you see that it's orange, right? Okay. Now, orange is primarily going to be, that's primarily going to be exciting, those long wavelength sensitive colors, the ones that you perceive as red, right? But there's some other ones there as well. Some green and some blue is going to be mixed in. And that's why you don't perceive that door as a pure red. It's another color, right? So some of the other wavelengths are there. They're present. They're exciting. Those cones, right? So that's cool. But they're primarily going to be exciting the long wavelength sensitive cones the most. So you're going to perceive it as more red than other colors. Does that make sense to everybody? We can tell the exact same story and guess what we are, because I don't think you all got it the first time. Uh, I'm going to tell the exact same story, Marissa, with green. How's that sound? How many of you have seen something that's green? I mean, no, nobody on this campus has ever seen the color green. Uh, right? I, I mean, which is really, uh, I'm telling you, my least favorite holiday is St. Patrick's Day. Uh, right, Caleb? I mean, I mean, for like a lot of reasons. One, I hate getting pinched. Right? I think it's a little weird that everybody goes out to drink a whole lot on a holiday named after like a Catholic saint. So, I, so, so that that really gives me like some like, eh, I don't know uh, about it, right? Also, the St. Valentine's thing is kind of a weird one too, right? I'm not gonna tell you what people do on that day. Um, but also, I don't. Also, a little weird, right? If you're thinking like, oh, this is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to go any f further with this line of, of logic because I think that's as far as we need to go with that, right? So you guys think about the stuff you did last time on St. Patrick's Day or St. Valentine's Day and see if, I don't know if any of you are Catholic, but imagine if you are, like that might actually have to make you go to confessional or whatever they do, right? I don't know how that process works. So, um, so there you go, Caleb. I don't know if you know how it works. I don't. So there's the heads up. Although I did just buy a Stephen Colbert Midnight Confessionals book, which was kind of funny. I got it on sale for two dollars. So there you go. Um, so I hate St. Patrick's Day because of the pinching mostly. The rest of it just doesn't make any sense and you're allowed to do whatever stupid thing you want to do on your own. Um, and then they like put every, make everything the color green. That seems a little ridiculous too, right? I mean, like, if you really wanted to study, like, celebrate something from Ireland, you should just eat potatoes, right? Like, I feel like that would be a, right? I mean, that seems to make more sense to me than, like, green beer. So just, I don't know. That's my take on it. And there's just me, like, ruining St. Patrick's Day for you. So you're welcome. Um, and then my wife, who has red hair, tries to tell me she doesn't have to wear green on St. Patrick's Day because if you have red hair, you get a pass on that. Does that make any sense to anybody? Because it didn't to me. I mean, not that I try to go around pinching her for any reason, but, or any more or less on St. Patrick's Day than the other day, right? Because, again, I don't celebrate St. Patrick's Day. But I do hate being pinched. And I hate people telling me I have to wear a certain color. See, there's like so many problems with this day. Right? So the point is, you've seen the color green. When you see the color green, there are probably other wavelengths of light in that as well, right? Because there are different shades of green. Some more green, some less green, right, Oliver? You've, you've seen them, right? Uh, when you see the color green, guess what? Those medium wavelength sensitive cones get the most excited. The other cones get a little bit excited. Hey, this is a great time for me to tell you about something I've already told you about. Are you ready, Marissa? How many of you remember univariates? How many of you want to turn back three pages in your notes, past the cat you drew, uh, and take take a look at what univariates was? Because it was exciting. If you remember, we had this conversation about we had this conversation about the the photon, right? And we said you're more likely to absorb a photon if 
comes in perpendicular. And it's the right wavelength. Okay? But we said sometimes it's not the right wavelength. Sometimes it comes in at an odd angle. So sometimes, even if you're looking at something that's purely green, and only that medium wavelength, sometimes it'll still excite those other cones, though, because of those accidental things that happen, right? So that's okay. So, and then we get some, some green gets excited there. It's not on here. But what do you think happens when you see short wavelengths of light? Anybody want to venture a guess? This is important, actually. So, when you had long wavelengths of light, what, got, what happened? Your long wavelength sensitive cones were most excited. When you had medium wavelengths of light, your medium wavelength sensitive cones were most excited. When you have short wavelength light, what do you think happens? Go ahead, Taylor. I know you know the answer. Yeah, the short, the short uh, wavelength sensitive cones get most excited and you perceive the color blue. See how simple that is? And that's all about cone excitation ratios. Now, that covers three of those primary colors. And Oliver, I know you're waiting on your fourth and most favorite primary color, and that's the color yellow, right? Because I can tell that you are a Nashville Predators fan and they wear yellow, right? You're not a Nashville Predators fan. Not, not really. You're just like, okay, that's fine. I mean, you know, just, just whatever. Uh, a, a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. No. <laughs> Trying to, a, a Pirates fan. You don't watch baseball. Watch baseball. That's fine. Um, who else has it is yellow as their primary color? Pick your favorite team that's yellow. You don't have a favorite yellow team? That's fine. There we go. When you see the color yellow, okay, guess what happens? Your red and your green, your medium and your long wavelength sensitive cones both get equally excited. The blue gets a little bit excited, but mostly it's the red and the green. Okay? Now, if I were to simultaneously show you red and green light, the same thing would happen. Now that's at a different sort of absolute value there, right? So, so if you look, look at where that blue is compared to this blue. And now look at where the red and the green are compared to those red and green, right? Absolute values are different, but guess what's not different? Cone excitation ratios, right? It's about the ratio. Who is getting more excited than somebody else? Not how much are you getting excited, but how much more are you getting excited than another cone type? That's what's important. Okay? Have any of you ever read A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court? All right. So what you should do after class is go read that book and anything else by Mark Twain you can get your hands on. Um, so in this book, he has this guy, whatever. It's not important. There are these two people who are having a conversation. And one of them, for their wage, they make a dollar a day. Okay, because they live in a castle in medieval times, so a dollar a day is fine. And the other person only makes 50 cents a day. And the guy who makes a dollar a day says, I'm clearly richer than you because guess what? I make a dollar a day and you only make 50 cents a day. Now that seems like a reasonable response, right? Until the guy who only gets 50 cents a day says, guess how much I pay for a chicken? I pay 10 cents for a chicken. And the other guy says, well, I pay a dollar and a quarter for a chicken. It's all about excitation ratios, right? So the guy who paid 10 cents for a chicken, he made less money, but he also spent less money on food, right? Relative to his, his total income. So it's all about excitation ratios. Same thing here with cones. Doesn't matter how much it gets excited. The blue can get super excited. But if the red and the green are more excited, then guess what? It's not blue that we're seeing, right? Okay. It's red or green or, in this case, we're talking about yellow. Does that make sense? Who doesn't understand this concept? This is an important concept most likely going to appear on a piece of paper I'm going to give you in a few weeks. 
All right, Macy. Um, I just need you to repeat like, the last thing you said. It's not about the... Absolute. It's not about like if you're really excited. Right? Blue can be really excited. Those, those short wavelength sensitive cones can be really, really excited. But you still may not be perceiving that as blue. And the reason for that is the red and the green, or the medium and the, or the long and the medium sensitive cones might be even more excited. Right? And then you would be perceiving yellow in that case, because they'd both be yellow. So it's just about which one is more, the most excited. Absolutely. It's about comparing activity across the three cone types. Okay? It's not about what any individual cone type is doing. It's what is it doing in relation to the other two cone types. That's what's important. Okay? So for example, uh, how many of you have ever been in a race? Okay. Regan, have you ever been in a race? Did you ever run track? Did you ever you never ran a race in elementary school like a turkey trot? Or, yeah. Turkey trot, okay. Uh, did you ever win the turkey trot? No, okay, that's fine. Um, how fast do you have to run to win a turkey trot? But really just faster than the next. Yeah, there's not like an actual value, right? If, if this group of people were in a turkey trot, then you just had to run faster than whoever the next fastest person is, right? Um, if for some reason Usain Bolt was in that race, you have to run faster, right, than Usain Bolt, which is not going to happen. So it's not about like absolutely how fast you're running. It's about your relative speed to other people in the race, right? It's the same thing here with cones. You, doesn't matter how excited you get. Get as excited as you want if you're a medium wavelength cone. But if you're not more excited than the other two guys, you're not going to be seen green. Okay? Does that work? So how fast, if you're ever in a race, how fast should you run? Just a little bit faster than the next guy. Because uh, you don't want to wear yourself out. That's thinking. All right. Now, that was a big long story and we forgot about metaverse. I'm going to bring you back to metaverse. So we need to talk about this. Why do metaverse appear identical? It's because they create the same pattern of firing in those three cone types. Right? They have the same cone excitation ratios. So if I just show you that one wavelength of light. It's going to excite all three cones in some pattern, right? Some are going to be more excited than others for cone types, right? It's going to go up and down. When I show you the metamer of that color, when I show you two or three wavelengths of light that appear to be the same color to you, guess what? We get the exact same ratio of firing across those cone types, okay? And that's why they appear to be the same color. Who's excited by that? Correct answer, your cones. That's what you should have said. And how much are they excited? Well, it's all relative to how excited the other cones are. It's all about cone excitation ratios. Okay? Now, metamerism is awesome and actually supports that trichromatic theory that there are these three uh, different photopigments. This was originally put forth by this guy, George Palmer, uh, back in 1777. There was some awesome stuff going on in 1777. Uh, how many of you knew it had to do with color vision? Nobody, right? Okay. Nobody thought about that. Later folks came along. Uh, Thomas Young, who remembers Thomas Young? We talked about him, right? The two-slit experiment. You guys remember that? Uh, Maxwell, and then uh, Hermann von Helmholtz always gets his hands in everything. So there you go. Now, I'm going to have to add something here. Because we've really been talking about trichromatic vision, and adding that fourth guy, that, that yellow color was a little fuzzy, right? So actually, there's something that we call the dual process theory. And basically, we're taking those three cone types, long, medium, and short, okay, 
and we can combine those in a way that we create uh, sort of these opponent color processing inputs. All right, so we have sort of red, green, and uh, blue, yellow channels. We're not going to worry about this light, dark channel for now. So we assume if red is excited, then green's not going to be excited. If green's excited, then red's not going to be excited, right? So there are this opponent process. And here, we take the red and the green together and then assume that blue is going to be not excited. If it is, or if it is excited, the blue or the red and the green, it won't be excited. Now, hold on a moment because we're gonna we're gonna get there. When we do this, uh, this helps us set up that yellow channel. This also helps explain why one of the reasons why red green color blindness is the most common. Okay. So if you have some problems in your red or your green photoreceptors, uh, you know they're gonna they're gonna that whole channel is gonna be messed up. For this dual process, there it really helps uh, sort of remedy this this rift between the four primary colors and only the three photopigments, right? So that first stage, we do the trichromatic retinal. Uh, we have those receptors. Second step is we're going to create those opposing pairs: the red and the green, and the blue and the yellow, right? And that dual process that's going to give us we're going to have three channels. We're going to combine those three channels in a way to get the four cardinal colors, okay? Does that make sense? Now, there's some interesting things to think about when we think about the way that colors interact. And we have this thing called color contrast. Essentially, what's going on here is that the saturation of a color is influenced by the surrounding color, okay? So if we look here at the top, and I think this is really cool with the blue, uh, right? And also here in the, the uh, orange and the green, okay? So if you look at this, the ring in the center of this annual, oh, But if you look at this, what you can see is that these patches uh, may appear more or less blue or green depending on their surrounding color, right? So if you look at this, this is very similar to that uh, contrast lab that we did. You guys remember that? Okay. Where you could have, uh, where we saw like different grays uh, or lighter or darker. I think one of the coolest places is down here. So if you look at this quadrant, and you see that it's like purple and orange, and then you see this band of color that uh, probably appears a bit more green to most of you, right? Now if you move over to this other quadrant, again you have your oranges and purples, this band of color appears more blue, right? Uh, but if you follow this around, it's really the exact same color all the way around. The color of the that blue or green band does not change. The colors that change are the flanking colors, right? So when it's flanked by orange, it appears more green. When it's flanked by purple, uh, it, it appears more blue. Can everybody see that? Kind of exciting, right? Uh, this is a fun one. So I'm going to pause this. All right. Remember that time I said, hey, do any of you get photic seizures? Like, do you get seizures from seeing flashing lights? 
Now's the time when that comes to be important, okay? Because today you're gonna see some flashing lights. You're ready for that. All right, so this is kind of cool. So what you need to do is you need to stare at this red dot in the middle. And you need to stare at it for a few seconds, okay? And don't try to follow what's going on around in the rings. Just stare at that red dot and let's see what happens. Is everybody ready? Because it's going to be thrilling. In all reality, it's actually pretty cool. Anybody see anything cool? Do you see Mona Lisa's face? <laughs> oh, that doesn't happen. You may need to move. Uh, what you should see is if you stare at that red dot in the middle, you should see what appears to be in the green ring a magenta, you know, in that empty space, you, you should see a magenta block moving around. And in the magenta ring, you should see a green ring or a green block moving around. Does anybody see that? It's kind of cool, right? It's not really there. You can actually follow that green spot around this disappearing or the, the magenta spot. And what you will notice is that it's not showing you the opposite color. Does everybody see what we're talking about or at least understand it on some level? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? This is uh, called uh, chromatic adaptation. Essentially what you're doing is, you, because this is wired up in that opponent processing, right? So in this case, we're looking at the red and the green channels, right? When green is excited, uh, more than the red, guess what color you're seeing? Green, that's the answer. If the green cones are more excited than the red cones, you're going to see green, okay? And that's what's happening mostly in the outer ring, right? Most of those blocks, they're all green, so you're gonna see green. When that green disappears, okay, what's more excited then, the green or the red? Well, the red's still kind of randomly excited, right? But the green is losing its excitation, and it's also probably, they're fatigued a little bit, right, Justin? So they're like, oh, I'm not gonna fire any more action potentials on this. And guess what? That makes the red appear as though they are more excited. They're not really that excited very much, but they're just cone excitation ratio. They're relatively more excited, and then you perceive what uh, what is a red block, right? And the opposite's happening there in the, in the, in the, uh, the center ring. Does that make sense to everybody? So Regan, this is like if you were in the Olympics running in a race and uh, you know, you're not gonna do very well. I'm, I'm just gonna tell you that. But if you were running against a bunch of third graders, you might do really well, right? Uh, your speed is not improving. Right? But it's your competition that's changing. Okay? So you're that red cone in that outer ring and you're getting as excited as you've always been about whatever color this is. But the people around you, the cones around you, those green cones are less excited now. So that little bit of excitation that you had relatively looks like a lot. Right? And so then what you would perceive is sort of a red color in that block. It's pretty cool, right? talked about that, about adaptation. Uh, we've exposed an area of the red to a specific color. It loses sensitivity to that color, right? And really what we're doing is, if we're making it less sensitive to one color, relatively speaking, we're making it more sensitive to that complementary color, right? So if we're making it less sensitive to red, it's going to be more sensitive to green because the red and the green are opponent color processing. Same thing with blue and yellow. It's all about relative excitation, right? And those cone excitation ratios. Just in case you have not heard me say cone excitation ratios before, 
I'm again going to say cone excitation ratios. This is probably the most important fundamental concept in color vision. Caleb, are you looking it up in the book? It's in there, I promise. Cone excitation ratios. Okay. Here's the basic story, right? I mean, if you um, stare at a bunch of green, uh, gray, then everything is sort of equally excited. If you stare at blue, blue gets excited. If you're yellow, red and green get excited relative to the blue. It's not a big deal. Okay? Does that work for everybody? Now, why in the world do we have this happen, right? So it's kind of important. So light from your, uh, you know, reaches your eye from whatever surface. Depends on a couple things. Okay? Depends on the spectral properties of the light. Okay? So whatever light uh, is coming, whether it's fluorescent light or the sun, it's going to be different. And it re uh, relies on the reflectance of the surface. Okay? So we already talked about this a little bit. A surface reflectance, right? Now, that spectral reflectance, that's an inherent property of the surface, okay? That's not going to change just because you took it outside. I was at uh, Lowe's Home Improvement uh, a couple years ago. I had this really awesome display, and it was this device, and I wish they'd let me take it, but they wouldn't. Uh, it had the same color paint chip, right? So, so you guys, anybody ever picked out paint for your house or your room or your car or your dog? Anybody's ever painted their dog? You should give it a try. Uh, so when you pick out paint and you go to the store, you have those paint chips, right? So these little, like, squares of the color, and you're like, oh, that's the color I want. I'm going to go with whatever that is. What was interesting is they had sort of this box where you could put that paint chip in, and they had three light sources, one that represented fluorescent light, one that was incandescent light, which is like the normal light bulbs, right, and then a third that represented daylight, so you could see what it would look like if, if the sun was shining on it. And your color would obviously look a little bit different in each of those three conditions, because the spectral properties of each of those light sources are different, right? Okay. So, for example, fluorescent lights tend to throw out blue wavelengths of, or, uh, yeah, they tend to do a little more blue uh, than some others. The sun does a lot of blue. Incandescent bulbs tend to do uh, more red. Okay. And so you have these... Uh, you know, sort of different types of light, different wavelengths of light hitting a, a surface, and they're going to make items appear different, okay? Now, with paint chips, this is not so important, okay? With paint chips, it's not so important, like, oh, what, uh, what, what color is that? Uh, who cares if it looks like it's, you know, periwinkle or whatever, right? That's not so important. What is important is using color for identification, okay? So let's think about two things that are shaped the same that come in different colors. Uh, what about snakes? How many of you have ever seen a snake? So you seem to really have a response to that. Okay. Uh, and, and what's important sometimes is the color of that snake. Uh, whether or not it will kill you, right? Okay. And so if all snakes were the same color, you would never know, right? And so that would be bad. But what we want to do is we want to eliminate the, the possibility that the light source is making a snake look like it can kill you or not, right? We really want to know, is that snake dangerous? Okay. And so because, because we have that contrast and adaptation, we can actually start to discount the effects of the light source and really just figure out what is it about the object, in this case the snake, 
right? That's reflecting light, and that makes it important for identification. Does that make sense? Because what if I could just shine a certain light on a snake and it's always going to look like a cobra? That seems like a bad idea. Because then there are going to be snakes that are not deadly, and they're going to go like, well, that's a cobra. Or worse, it's the opposite of that. Um, if you shine a light on a snake and it makes it look like a, uh, like a rat snake, for example, which is not a deadly snake by any means, unless you're a rat. Uh, and then you think, oh, that's just a rat snake. I think I'll pet that. But in reality, it was a cobra and you die. So now do you see why cone excitation ratios are important? So you don't die from the bite of a cobra. I'm trying to give you guys important lessons. Because do you know how many cobras there are in the state of West Virginia? Like four. And they're all owned by people, for whatever reason, who think they need to own a cobra. I'm a member of the International Cobra Registry Association. So we keep track of where all the cobras are. That's not true, Justin, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many cobras there are in West Virginia. Not many, because you don't have to worry about it. Although, who wants to hear a story about cobras in Missouri? You guys ever watch that show, Mysteries at the Museum? Anybody ever seen that show? Yeah, right? So, so go ahead and admit to it, right? Because it's okay. It's not the worst thing you could be watching, right? So I was watching that show one day, like, looked through the channels, and it came on, and it was about this cobra outbreak in Missouri. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting, because what I know about Missouri and what I know about cobras is they don't belong together. Well, apparently, there was a, an actual cobra infestation in this town in Missouri. True story. Uh, this was probably back in like the 30s or 40s. And I thought, well, so people would go around in these trucks like playing music, which is ridiculous, Abby, because snakes are largely deaf. So they were playing music and they had like their guns and their pickaxes trying to like lure the cobras out on, you know, this is ridiculous, right? Um, and so, but there were a number of cobras that were caught and killed, right? And, and you know, that's probably fine. Uh, so finally, like years later, like decades later, this guy admits to he's the person who caused the cobra outbreak. It all started because of a pet shop's return policy, right? So this kid, he bought a goldfish at a pet shop, and it died before he got home. Which when you buy a goldfish, if it's, if it's not dead when you buy it, good, right? There, there's no guarantee on the life of the goldfish, I'm just gonna tell you that. So he gets back to his home, the goldfish is dead, he goes back to the pet shop. The pet shop owner says, no, I'm not taking the goldfish back. You know, you, you bought a goldfish, buddy. You made it home with it and didn't disintegrate. You got your money's worth, right? So the kid gets mad. He goes around back to the pet shop. And there's a box there. And in his anger, he kicks it, Abby. He kicks it. Guess what was in that box? Cobras. Now, why in the world this pet shop owner had a box of cobras? I still don't understand. Uh, I understand the kid's reaction, right? Because, if I, you know, I've kicked things when they wouldn't take back a goldfish, right? That's a reasonable response, right, Marissa? But it's not reasonable for a pet shop owner to have a crate full of cobras. But apparently, that's what released all the cobras. The kid was afraid to tell anybody, which you would be, right, if you'd like cause this big cobra outbreak in the middle of Missouri. So I don't know. Imani, I found that story very interesting. I think what most people found interesting about that was like the cobras, but, but I was like, why did the pet shop owner have, I mean, that's the guy at fault, not this kid, right? I mean, the kid's doing normal kid things, kicking something because you didn't take back his goldfish. Pet shop owner, why'd you have a crate full of cobras? I still don't understand. That's the real mystery. And there's a museum apparently in Missouri, the whatever county Missouri museum, history museum, and they have a jar with a cobra in it. Uh, for, you know, it's like in formaldehyde, and you can go see that. So if any of you are planning to go to Missouri soon, stop by. They'll be happy to have a guest. That's a true story. It's weird, right? Hey, who loves fruit? Yeah, fruit, right? And Monty's like, I'm excited about fruit. I don't know why. Most emphatic response of anybody. Um, what's interesting about this, here we have, this is an example of artificial light. Okay, Here's daylight and, uh, and then 
clear blue sky. Now, if you look across this, you can see that there's a lot of variation in the color balance, right? And a lot of that's based on the light source, the illuminant. But what's really interesting about this, in every single one of these, you can pick out the lemon from the lime, right? Lemons and limes are shaped roughly the same, right? They're both kind of shapes. But in every one of these, the lime appears to be the most green. And then here you have your lemon, that's, that's definitely yellow. Okay. The relative perception of the colors is the same across these three lighting conditions, even though if you were to compare the lemon here to the lemon here, you would say those are two different colors, right? Okay. But if I were to just show you any one of these images, what color would you tell me this piece of fruit was? You tell me it was yellow, right? So it's color constancy. Uh, another great example of this is grass. I can look outside the window, you can't because you're too far away. Uh, so, sorry about that. But I can look out the window and I can see grass and, and then I can see that some of it's green, most of it's brown, the patch I see. Uh, but I can, you know, it's a cloudy, very overcast day. Uh, in a couple days when the sun shines again, it'll still be green, right? The grass will still appear green to me. Even at night, the grass will appear green to me. That's color constancy, okay? It's going to be perceived as the same color even though the illuminant has changed. And that's because we're really interested in what are the properties of the object itself for identification. So color constancy is very important to us. Anybody have questions about that? Hey, guess what color causes color constancy? Anybody have an idea? Cone excitation ratios. Don't worry about this, it's what we just talked about. Uh, we will talk about color deficiencies a little bit. So, uh, some folks have color deficiencies, and basically that means they cannot discriminate between colors. Okay, so they have some reduced capacity to do that. They are what we call anomalous trichromats. Okay. Uh, these folks have three different cone types that have three different spectral sensitivities. They're not, however, the same spectral sensitivities as most uh, most people. Okay, so their their cone sensitivities are shifted. They still have three separate ones, but they're going to shift. Okay. Does that make sense? Folks who are dichromats, they only have two cone types. Uh, and so they only need two of the primaries to get matches, but that third cone type's not doing anything for them. They're just kind of out there. Now folks who are dichromats, sometimes they'll be, uh, they'll be completely missing a cone type, or that third cone type will be mutated so that it's almost identical to one of the other two. And then there are folks who are monochromats, uh, and they only see things in, in sort of grayscale. So what can cause color deficiencies was well, kind of interesting, actually. Uh, it's always because of some problem with your cone pigments, your cone photopigments, okay? Either you're missing that photopigment or that cone type entirely, or you uh, have three clone, uh, three cone classes, but they're shifted, right? Okay. That's what we've talked about before. missing one of those photopigments, so you can't make uh, discriminations. The most common type of color blindness is red-green color blindness. What's interesting about that is the red and the green uh, spectral sensitivities are, are nearly the same, they're the closest 
blue has shifted over quite a bit. So red and green are actually, um, if there's any abnormality in the red or the green cone or that photopigment, then you're gonna have some problems because it's gonna probably bring those sensitivities closer together. Okay. What's interesting about this is, is color deficiencies are more common in males than females. It's because it is a, uh, what we call a sex linked disorder. It's uh, on the X chromosome. Here's a brief reminder. Females have typically two X chromosomes. So if you get one that's sort of screwed up, you just use the other one. Males, on the other hand, typically get one X chromosome. Uh, if that one's screwed up, you gotta use it anyway. So for a female to have color, a color deficit, she would have to have two, you know, both of her X chromosomes would actually have to be um, abnormal for color vision. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. There's some points you can remember, some things you can forget. Any questions about color?